Okay, let's begin from page 37. We have a very short paragraph. And some questions at the top. It says that we should try to skim for information, which means read quickly only for the information that we need. So let's uh, go question by question. Question one, how was Wei Yi negotiating? Uh, so I guess this means spoken or written negotiating, right? Because it says the difference between spoken and written. And uh, Wei Yi says sometimes written negotiations are tricky uh, because the wording can be more difficult than just speaking. Once when I was negotiating online. OK, so at this point, I think we can conclude that she is using written negotiation, right? My counterpart wrote. So the answer to question one is written negotiating. Number two, with whom was he negotiating? We also just saw this with a Swiss company. So that's number two. Number three, what was he negotiating a contract for? What did he want? So let's keep reading. Proposed rate is really too high. I'm sure you don't want to kill the cow whose milk you want. Milk? I was negotiating a service contract for trucks and ships. So that's the answer to number three. A service contract for trucks and ships. Number four, does Wei Yi prefer face-to-face -face or online negotiations? Why? Uh, at the bottom it says, if I could see his face or his body language, I could at least guess about his feelings. So it looks like he would rather have face-to-face -face negotiations. He wants to be able to see uh, the other person. And then number five, what did Wei Yi's Swiss counterpart write? What did he mean? So I think this is uh, referring to this phrase, right? I'm sure you don't want to kill the cow whose milk you want. What does that mean? You want the milk, you shouldn't kill the cow. Uh, I think here it probably means like, uh, if you want to keep doing business with me, uh, you should, you shouldn't play hardball. You should give me more space. You should give uh, compromise more. Otherwise, he will leave. OK, questions? Right, let's move on to the next part. How to negotiate the wrong way. OK, I, I really don't think we should be emphasizing the wrong way to do something. So uh, I'll lead you through these points. We can talk about a better way to negotiate. So the first one, it says it is appropriate to show your real feelings. Losing your temper is a natural thing to do. Uh, we know that it's more important to be patient and tolerant and compassionate. Uh, instead of losing your temper during a negotiation. Number two, uh, instead of influencing, arguing your main point is a good strategy. Uh, so we can tell that the answer is, in fact, the best way to negotiate is to influence. It's not to use just the best reasons, but it's to use the most convincing reasons. You want to get the other person to change their mind. Number three, never compromise. Obviously, it should be always try to compromise. Uh, always be prepared to compromise. 
Number four, impatience is not a big problem. No, impatience is a big problem. You have to be patient with the other person. Negotiating can take a lot of time and energy. Number five, do not over prepare. Just the opposite. You should try to prepare as much as you can. The more you understand the other side, the better you can try to change their mind. Number six, ignore conflicts. No, if a conflict appears, you must try to solve the conflict. Negotiating is not just about uh, the right price. It's also about building relationships. Number seven, feel free to talk too much and listen little. No, you must listen more than you talk. The best way to change someone's mind is to understand what they really want and try to help them get it without giving away what you want as well. So you need to listen. And number eight, intimidating or scaring your counterpart is a successful way to win at negotiating. No. Again, negotiation is a kind of relationship, so you don't want to scare the other person. You want to get them to help you, and you also want to help them to create a win-win situation. Questions? I think this is a really important idea that negotiations are about relationships more than the details of your agreement. Uh, a few months ago, I was watching a documentary about um, how the US helped with the Israeli Palestinian negotiations in the 90s. And from that documentary, I learned that the situation never ch changed a lot. The Israelis and the Palestinians, uh, their positions were basically the same all the time. What changed was how the U.S. brought people together to build relationships and to build trust. So that when one side had to give something away, they trusted that the other side would quickly follow and give something away as well. So no matter if you're trying to build world peace or you're just trying to get a good business deal, relationships and trust are the most important part of negotiation. OK. Um, let's go to page 40. Tips for writing. Critically evaluate your ideas. So when you have time and uh, in your writing, uh, after you put your ideas on paper and you need to go back and edit, these are some points that you can think about uh, whether you need to change or improve your writing. So these are some uh, mistakes that many people make. Generalizations. Uh, sometimes we call this over generalization. In Chinese, we call this yi pian gai quan. So uh, the most common markers of over generalization are words like all, always, and every. If you say, for example, all Americans like to eat beef, that's probably not true. You should change it to say most Americans or many Americans. Most Americans may also not be true. Many Americans is definitely true. America has 212 million people. Any group of people who, any group of Americans who love to eat beef will be many people. So that's definitely true. Another common mistake is oversimplification. Uh, saying 
very certainly that A caused B. A, B is because of A. Life is not that simple. Things have many different causes. Situations are complicated. Um, so you should remember that when you're writing about something that happened. For example, if couples love each other, they will be happy. Maybe, but maybe not. If people use computers, education in Taiwan will be much better. OK, again, this was written in 2003. Today we are living in the future. People do use computers. Education is about the same, I think. Um, so when you're thinking about cause and effect, remember that life can be complicated. And the third common mistake is a contradiction. Uh, of course, usually it's not a, uh, an obvious contradiction. Usually you don't say one thing in the first sentence and then say the opposite thing in the next sentence. Usually a contradiction appears in the early part of your essay and then the late part of your essay. Like when you write, uh, you follow the ideas, you keep writing, and the ideas sort of get away from you. And so by the end, you're saying something different from how you started. And in this kind of situation, you might find a contradiction uh, between the early part of your essay and the late part of your essay. So when you edit and revise the show guide as a whole, be careful uh, that you avoid contradiction. So for example, if you're in this example, if you're writing an essay about, uh, let's say Taiwan's semiconductor industry, you might begin with a sentence supporting the free market. But you might end by saying that we need to protect our important industries like semiconductors. But these two sentences could be seen as a contradiction. If you support a free market, that means that you let the market decide which industries thrive and which industries falter. If you protect some industries and not others, that is not a free market. Um, but if you want to get philosophical about it, oftentimes what you think is a contradiction is actually just a paradox. You guys know the, the difference between a contradiction and a paradox? A paradox is logical if you think about it the right way. A contradiction is not logical. So I think here in this example, these two sentences are only a paradox. There's a way that you can say both and still be logical. We believe in free market competition, but some industries need to be especially protected. So in principle, if there's no uh, important reason to protect certain industries, then we should not mess with the free market. But if there is an important reason, such as national security, Guadandrin, then uh, it is OK to protect some important industries. So in that way, uh, we can put these two sentences together. They look like they're a contradiction, but actually they can work together. But in general, uh, be careful that you avoid uh, sentences that could look like contradictions. If they look like contradictions, try to find a way to explain them so that they can fit together. Questions? Uh, 
OK, next page. Let's practice some speaking. Um, let's see, hang on. Let's uh, I'll guide you through part A and then you guys can can practice uh, starting in part B. So part A. Think about this. Uh, negotiating often happens between a supplier or a salesperson and a purchaser or a customer. Uh, in other words, usually one person is selling and the other person is buying. If you are a salesperson for a company that supplies products, what is important to you? Um, so there are six ideas here. If you are selling something, which ideas are the most important? Uh, so the first one, can I sell my customer any other products from my company? Second one, how long will I have to negotiate with this customer today? Third one, should I give my customer tea, coffee, or juice before we negotiate? OK, I think this one is probably the least important one. Number four, what does my customer really want? I think this one is the most important. Like, for example, if your customer walks in and they want to buy a computer. They don't really want a computer. They want convenience in their life. They want better entertainment. Uh, so from that point of view, you can consider some other products that also provide these experiences, not just computers. The fifth one, what is the cheapest price known as the bottom line I can give my customer? OK, this phrase is very common. The bottom line. It actually has two meanings. One meaning is the one here, the cheapest price. But its original meaning is simply the total price or the conclusion. If you're talking about something that doesn't regard money, it's the conclusion. The bottom line, of course, is where you add everything together and you produce one number. So if you're talking about an issue and you want somebody to remember the most important point, you can say that the bottom line is blah, 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 the most important point. After looking at all of these ideas, the, the total conclusion you should remember is something. And then the sixth one, what does my boss really want? Uh, also probably not very important. So like if I were selling something, I would say that uh, the most important one is the fourth one. What does my customer really want? Uh, the next most important will be the second one. How long will I have to negotiate? You need to know how much time you have in order to plan your strategy. Uh, then I think the third most important is what is the cheapest price? You don't want to tell your customer what is the cheapest price, but you yourself should know how low can you go. That will also help you prepare your negotiation strategy. Uh, the fourth most important to me would be, can I sell this person anything else? The fifth most important, what does my boss want? And then the least important, should I give my customer tea, coffee, or juice? By the way, do you guys know why uh, when you go buy a car or buy a house or, or like go buy glasses or get a haircut or whatever. Do you know why they give you something to drink? Because according to psychology, 
once you start saying yes, it's easier for you to keep saying yes. So if they ask you, do you want something to drink and you say yes? Or they say like, do you want tea or coffee and you make a decision? Your mind thinks that you are already involved in getting things uh, and accepting things. And so later when they ask you, oh, do you want to try this? Do you want to buy that? You are more likely to say yes. Very sneaky marketing. OK, the next one, when you negotiate with your customer, what personal traits are most important to you to have a successful negotiation? Uh, let's look at these. To be persistent and determined. Yeah, that's pretty important. Uh, if the customer says no, you don't want to just let them go. Number two, be polite. Also very important. Number three, be patient. Very important. Number four, be direct and frank. OK, these are actually two different ideas. To be uh, to be frank means to be honest. But you can be direct and not be frank. Uh, I think that is the better way to do it. Say always be clear, always let the customer understand what you're saying. But you don't have to tell the customer everything at first. Number five, be good looking. I'm sure this helps. I wouldn't know. Number six, be optimistic. Also quite important. Number seven, be confident. Usually if you're confident, you will also be optimistic. I would put those two together. Number eight, be organized. Also quite important. You want to prepare for your negotiation. So I think uh, out of all of these, the, the least important two would be to be frank and to be optimistic. You shouldn't always be frank immediately. Later in the negotiation, you can start being more honest. Um, and as for optimistic, if you're confident, then you will probably also be optimistic. But I think all the other ones are pretty important. OK, part B. This is uh, where you guys get to practice talking. Uh, let's see. Yeah, ha we have two situations here. Ah, OK, so one person is buying and one person is selling. Cool, OK, student A is selling and student B is buying. Uh, so let's take a look at what each person wants. Student A, you are the president of Glow Flashlight Company. Each of your Glow Flashlights usually sells for $120. You usually only sell about 3,000 flashlights to each customer. Your new customer wants to buy 15,000 flashlights for $105 each. You will meet your customer in two minutes. So hurry and prepare to negotiate a higher and more profitable price. Student B, you are the vice president of the purchasing department for Tools R Us Hardware Company. You are visiting Glow Flashlight Company today in two minutes. You usually only buy about 5,000 flashlights from most suppliers. However, you hope if you buy a larger quantity, you can get a much cheaper price. So you offer to buy 15,000 flashlights for $105 each. Persuade uh, Glow Flashlights that your price is reasonable. OK, so grab a partner. I'll give you 10 minutes to try to reach a good deal.
Okay, I hope you managed to get a good deal. Let's go to the next page, page 42. Here's another speaking practice for you. Second hand negotiating, er so tampan. Find something in your pencil box or book bag, something that you already have with you. Try to sell it to your partner. Okay, I'll give you another 10 minutes.
Did anyone make any money? OK, let's take a short break.
Okay, let's go to page 42. Let's do some listening practice. So let's take a look at this first question. Uh, part A. Enid Tsai, executive vice president of a renowned technology firm, graduated from Mingchuan in 1980. She is being interviewed about her views on successful negotiating. After you listen to the interview, check which topics below are very important, not very important, or not even discussed. Okay, so there are 11 topics, and for each one you can choose very important, not very important, or not discussed. So let's look at these topics. One, be polite and hospitable. Hospitable means you treat your guest well. How Number two, be Choose a perfect drink to serve your guests. Number three, develop a friendship with counterpart. Number four, use email to negotiate for expensive things. Number five, discuss extra things like spare parts. Uh, spare here means uh, in in preparedness. Materials, service, etc. Number six, be more direct with Japanese counterparts. Number seven, entertain Mexican business people. Number eight, make long term business relationships. Number nine, notice what time it is on the clock. Number 10, notice a counterpart's face and feelings. And number 11, don't show you have no time. OK, let's take a listen.
OK, so let's go through these topics. Number one, be polite and hospitable. This one is. Very important. Number three, develop a friendship with your counterpart. This one is. Very important. Number four, use email to negotiate for expensive things. This one is. Not very important. In the interview, Enid says that for expensive things, you should negotiate face to face. Number five, discuss extra things like spare parts, materials, service, etc. This one is. Very important. Enid mentioned that these extra things can get you millions more each year. Can earn you mil millions of dollars more each year. Number six, be more direct with Japanese counterparts. This one is. Not discussed. Enid says that East Asian and Asian business people usually focus on long term relationships and that Western business people are more direct. When she mentions Eastern business people, one example she gave was Japanese. <coughs> Japanese people. But she did not say that we should be more direct. With Japanese people or with Asian business people. Number seven, entertain Mexican business people. This one is. Not discussed. She didn't mention Mexicans. Number eight, make long term business relationships. This one is. Very important. She I think she mentions even when dealing with. Westerners, you can still try to build a relationship. Number nine, notice what time it is on the clock. This one is. Not discussed. She didn't mention looking at the clock. Number 10, notice a counterpart's face and feelings. This one is. Very important. Number 11, don't show you have no time. This one is. Very important. Enid says if your counterpart thinks that you don't have a lot of time, they will try to rush you through a deal. So don't show that you have no time. OK, on the next page, we have a second set of questions about this interview. Um, according to this question, Enid's negotiating strategy has four main steps. Uh, and each step has a main idea and uh, an example or more than one example. Um, so we're going to listen again and please fill out the rest of this table. Let's look at the information we already have. We have three main ideas. The first is courtesy or politeness. The third is to notice body language. And the fourth is patience. On the right, we have one example with no main idea, and this is the second one. The example is to compare a person's face to a real friend's face. So as we listen again, you can think about what is the main idea for this example. And for the other three examples, oh, sorry, for the other three main ideas, uh, try to give at least one example for each idea.
OK, so let's fill out this table on page 43. Step one. The main idea is courtesy or politeness. And the example is to offer your customer a drink like a coffee. Number two, the example is to compare a person's face to a real friend's face. For the main idea, it's one idea, but there are, I think, three ways to say this. Enid says that you should try to develop a relationship. You should try to build trust with your customer. And the interviewer says that you should try to develop a friendship with your customer. I think these three are the same idea. Number three, the main idea is to notice body language. And the example is to look at your counterpart's face when they react to your proposal. And number four, the main idea is patience. And the example is, uh, again, there's two ways to say this. Enid says that you should not show that you have to hurry. I think an easier way to say this is to show that you can wait. Show that you have time. OK, questions? I want to point out one thing, which is uh, when Enid is talking about like looking at the other person's reactions, her story is like if your proposal is too cheap, your price is too low, then you can see that the other side is very happy, and so you can therefore adjust your proposal. Not true. If your plan is too cheap and the other side is too happy, it's already too late. People assume that you walk into a negotiation uh, and then you slowly start to compromise. But if your first proposal is already acceptable to the other side, you have already made your offer, you cannot adjust. So if the reaction is that your proposal is too expensive, your price is too high, then you can talk and, and compromise. But if your proposal is too cheap, that's it, over. Okay, let's do the next uh, part of the listening practice. Negotiation on the phone. Read the questions, listen to the conversation, answer the questions. So let's look at the questions first. Situation. An export company, 出口公司, 出口商, is calling up a shipping firm, 货运商, to negotiate a price to send goods abroad. Uh, vocabulary. To call up means to start a phone conversation. You can just say call. It's the same thing. Okay, questions. One, where is Mr. Khan sending his goods? A, Lipton. B, Amsterdam. Amsterdam. C, Egypt. IG. D, London. I have no idea where Lipton is. Number two, according to this conversation, rate probably means A, an email, B, a price, C, a discount, so cool. D, a car. Number three, how does Mr. Khan feel about the rate of $20 per container? I think this gives us the answer to question two. Anyway. Um, how does Mr. Khan feel? A, he's looking forward to it. B, he's determined to keep the same price. C, he wants to reduce it. He wants to make it lower. D, 
D. He thinks it will make the economy decline. Uh, okay, some vocabulary. A container is something you use to hold something else. I think in this case it will be talking about a shipping container. Uh, and looking forward to it means uh, he, he thinks it's a good idea. Number four, what firm does Jake Khan work for? What is his company? <clears throat> a, Pitcher Exports Co. Co means company. You see this period? This period is for abbreviation. The full word is company. B, Sweet Ocean Shipping Company. C, East Lines Shipping. D, Con Lines Company. Okay, why do these two options have the word line? Because for shipping, they use uh, the, the route that the ship travels is called a shipping line. When you want to send something from uh, across a body of water, like across the ocean, the boats don't go in random places. They follow specific routes, specific lines of travel. So that's why shipping companies will often use the word line in their name. Number five, according to Jake, in other words, Mr. Khan, what is the rate for another shipping company? A, 1825, B, 1850, C, 1875, D, $19, E, 1925. Number six, next page. When Jake says, I'm not trying to rock the boat, what does he probably mean? A, he enjoys rock music while working in the office. B. He is not trying to give her a lot of trouble. C. He really enjoys negotiating a cheaper rate for goods. D. He does not want to make the container boat rock much in the water. Uh, rock the boat here. And to make the boat rock means to like make the boat um, shake. Yaobai. I think you can answer this question already. Number seven, what is Jake's final asking price? An asking price is an offer from the customer. He is asking if the Seller can sell at this price. Nineteen dollars even, which means no change, just a flat nineteen dollars. Nineteen twenty-five, nineteen fifty, nineteen seventy-five, or twenty dollars. And number eight, when Marina, I guess this is the other person, when Marina says you drive a hard bargain. What does she probably mean? A, Jake is an excellent or tough negotiator. B, Jake should not drive and bargain at the same time. C, Jake's bargains should be softer with more feeling. Or D, Jake is a win-win negotiator. I think you can also answer this question already. <clears throat> okay, let's take a listen to this negotiation.
OK, let's take a look at the answers. Number one, where is Mr. Khan sending his goods? D, London. Number two, according to this conversation, rate probably means B, a price. Number three, how does Mr. Khan feel about the rate of 20? C, he wants to reduce it. He thinks it's too high. Number four, what firm does Jake Khan work for? A, Pitcher Exports. Actually, this question you can answer without listening because these four companies, B, C, and D are all shipping companies. But Mr. Khan wants to send something somewhere, so he's talking with a shipping company. So he's not from a shipping company. So automatically, there's only one option, A. Number five, according to Jake, what is the rate for another shipping company? B, 1850. So this is a common negotiating strategy, right? If you think the price is too high, you can say, but somebody else is giving a lower price. Number six, when Jake says, I'm not trying to rock the boat, what does he mean? B, he's not trying to give her a lot of trouble. In the... Uh, discussion in the phone call, he says, I'm not trying to rock the boat. I'm just looking for a fair price. So he's not trying to cause trouble. Number seven, what is Jake's final asking price? 1925B. Number eight, you drive a hard bargain. What does this mean? A, Jake is an excellent or tough negotiator. In this phrase, drive, drive, the original meaning of the word drive is to lead or to cause to move. So when you drive a car, you are causing the car to move. Um, here it is saying that you're causing this bargain to be moved forward. You're causing the other person to take the bargain, to take the deal. So you're pushing this deal. You're driving a hard bargain. Um, in common English, the word drive is usually used in four places. One, drive a car. Two, drive a hard bargain. Three, someone has determination and drive. You li, you zixing li. The word drive as the the willpower to push forward. And number four, to drive a golf ball. When you're playing golf and you hit the ball, that action is called to drive the ball. Da golf drive. OK, questions? OK, let's do part C. Phone message. Listen to the telephone message and answer the questions. So let's talk. Let's look at the questions. One, what is the man selling? Oh, sorry, we should say what is a telephone message? This is when someone leaves you a voice uh, message on your phone. Ring liu yan. I don't think we do that a lot anymore. Uh, what is the man selling? A, men's shoes. B, fancy footwear. Footwear is just another word for shoes. So B is fancy shoes. Uh, fancy can mean expensive. Or C, it doesn't say. Number two, how much does the buyer propose to pay? $300 per pair, $275 per pair, or $150 per pair? Mei Shuang. 
a pair of shoes. Three, why doesn't the seller accept the proposal? A, the price is too high. B, the quantity is too low, so there are not enough. C, the price is too low. Number four, what is the regular price for the product? 300 per pair, 325 per pair, or 275 per pair? And number five, what is Mr. Jones' counter offer? Uh, so a counter offer is the offer that you give in return. So if someone gives me an offer, I don't think it's a good deal. I would give back a counter offer. So which one? 300 prepared, 325 prepare, or 275 prepare. Let's let, take a listen. Wow, that was a very information dense uh, phone message. Every line has important information. So we should listen to it again. Try to catch uh, what he's talking about. Uh, remember, the message is from the seller. He's trying to sell something. OK, so question one, what is the man selling? A, men's shoes. He says that uh, the other person called to ask to buy men's casual sandals. A sandal is liangxie, open-toed shoe. So it's talking about men's shoes. Uh, casual, de sandals, liangxie. The trick answer is B, because the seller's company name is Fancy Footwear. It's not what he's selling, that's just the name of his company. Number two, how much does the buyer propose to buy? B. $275 per pair. This was in the same sentence as the answer to number one. He said uh, to buy men's casual sandals at $270 per pair. Same sentence. Number three. Why doesn't the seller accept the proposal? 
uh, we will find the answer if we first look at number four. Number four, what is the regular price for the product? The seller says that the list price, which is the price on the advertising, on the commercials, the regular list price is 325B. Therefore, the answer to question three is C. The offered price is too low. So number five, what is the counter offer? What price does the seller offer in return? He says he can give a $25 discount. The list price is $325, $25 discount, $325, minus 25 is a $300 per pair. Questions? Okay. Um, that's it. We have reached the end of unit three, which also means we have reached the end of the uh, midterm exam range. For the midterm exam, you will be tested on units one and three, and also everything from the last semester. Do you have questions about this unit? Do you have questions about uh, the midterm exam range? OK, so let's take a short break. When we come back, we will start unit four.
OK, let's look at unit four, starting on page 45. Looks like this will be about stress. So let's look at some of the warm up questions to help uh, prepare to do the reading. Do you have trouble managing your time? Why or why not? What do you usually do when you are under time pressure? What are some of the latest events in your life that have made you unhappy or uncomfortable? Aside from English class. What could anyone say or do to you that can put you under stress? How do you usually deal with feeling nervous or uptight? Uptight is the opposite of relaxed. What could you say or do to your boyfriend or girlfriend that might put him or her under a lot of stress? And what might what could they say or do to you to create stress for you? With those questions in mind, let's take a look at the reading. Coping with stress. We all experience stress one way or another in our daily lives. Stress is the reaction of our bodies and minds to something disturbing or threatening that upsets our physical and emotional balance. The human response to stressful events dates back to ancient times when life was a daily struggle for survival. In those days, our early ancestors had to fight off wild animals and other threats in order to live. Today, we more likely experience stress in any situation or event that overwhelms us. For instance, demanding responsibilities at work or at home, serious illness, death of a family member or close friend, loss of a job or lover. We also experience stress when we feel helpless because we do not have the necessary ability or time to cope with a threatening situation. When we anticipate a threatening or stressful situation, our body experiences the fight or flight response. To prepare for fighting or fleeing, the body reacts by increasing its heartbeat, blood pressure, and breathing rate. Part of our nervous system becomes active and releases chemicals like adrenaline needed for fast action. Health experts agree that some stress is necessary for human survival. Stress can increase our energy level, make us feel challenged, and cause the physical and emotional changes required to deal with the situation. They call this positive stress. For instance, a minimum of stress before making a speech, taking an exam, or having an interview is quite normal and healthy. Athletes, entertainers, and public speakers have long understood that stress can help them to perform better. However, chronic stress, that is, stress that never goes away, is harmful for our health. 
Potential reactions to stress include headache or migraine, backache, insomnia, restlessness, cold hands, and excess perspiration. At its worst, chronic stress may lead to heart disease and stroke. Psychological symptoms of stress may include tension or anxiety, anger, depression, pessimism, and inability to concentrate or perform at usual levels. Furthermore, medical research has found that people who keep negative emotions inside are at higher risk for heart disease. Different people react to stressful situations differently, but we can learn to manage stress in a healthy way. The Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York gives the following advice. First, identify which events cause you to have stress-related symptoms. Next, find out your usual ways of responding to stress. Then, learn to develop and substitute more effective responses when needed. There are many potential responses suggested by the American Heart Association. For example, we can listen to music, watch TV or movies, or write a journal. Playing sports, doing exercise, getting more rest, or having a massage also helps. It is also advisable to go on a vacation or trip or simply go outdoors and enjoy nature. Whether at work or at home, we need to organize our time and environment, accept our limitations, and learn how to say no. Health experts suggest that we get information and ask for help as well as talk things over with friends or with a counselor. Last, we can look on the bright side of life, have a sense of humor, and engage in deep breathing, prayer, meditation, or yoga. It is important that we manage our stress effectively, for by managing our stress, we manage our life. OK, so you have a general idea of what this is about. Let's look at it in more detail. Coping with stress. Last time, I think last time, we talked about words meaning how to deal with something, how to handle something. The word cope means that you may not be able to solve the problem, but you can live with the problem. You can accept the problem, you can work with the problem, um, even if you can't solve it completely. So coping with stress means you may not be able to get rid of all of your stress. You may not want to, but you still have to learn how to manage it and to live with it. Usually in a title, we would not use a capital letter for the word with. The rule in English is to use a capital letter for nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, and the first word. The word with is a preposition, so it should not use a capital letter. First sentence, to experience stress, to have stress, to be under stress. One way or another, um, 
This simply means that different people have different kinds of experience. But if you begin a sentence with one way or another, that means anyways. In Chinese, we might say fan zhen, or if you're from an older generation, heng su. So it looks like the first paragraph is going to introduce the idea of stress. What is it? How does it affect our lives? So the second sentence is a definition. Stress is a reaction to something. When we use the word react or reaction, we react to something. It is a reaction to something. So notice that in this definition, it is bodies and minds. Stress happens in the mind, but it also happens in the body. A reaction to something disturbing or threatening. So we can understand threatening, right? Threatening means there's some kind of danger. Disturbing. In Chinese, we usually say disturb means daro, jingro. But in English, it can also mean something that makes you feel uncomfortable, unsafe, something that makes you feel weird. So the definition continues. Something disturbing or threatening that upsets our physical and emotional balance. So you, if you have a balance, uh, it, if you want to try to reach a balance, you would say to strike a balance. If you have a balance and you want to keep it, you would say to maintain balance. But if you if something causes you to lose balance, the word is upset. It upsets your balance. Now, usually the word upset uh, we use to say that somebody feels bad, right? I feel upset means I feel bad. But the original meaning has to do with balance. You can tell from the word, right? The word has up and set. When you set something down, you put something there and it stays and it doesn't move. But if you up that thing, then it falls or it moves around. So to upset is, um, I like to think of it as to flip a table. So to upset a balance is to cause to lose balance. Here it's physical and emotional. Uh, response to something, same thing as react, use the word to. To date back to, another way to say this is it goes back to, or it traces back to. In Chinese, we call this k hui su dao or zui su dao. Um, a daily struggle for survival. A struggle means you have to fight, you have to work for it, you have to fight for it. So here it is a struggle for survival, to keep living. had to fight off wild animals. So it's not just fight. The point is not to win the fight. The point is to get the wild animals to go away. So you use the word fight off. They attack you, you defend. They decide not to attack you anymore and they leave. Uh, Today, we don't have to fight wild animals. Instead, we have to fight situations or events that overwhelm us. 
that we cannot handle. To overwhelm in Chinese, I often say yin mo guo chu. It's the the in the emotion is too strong. You can't handle the situation. For instance, so for example, demanding responsibilities. Okay. The word demanding here is not a verb, it's an adjective. Think about the word surprising. Surprising. It could also be a verb, right? I'm I'm uh how should I say this? I am surprising him with a party tomorrow. Meaning so the word surprising can be a verb or an adjective. Here the same thing. A demand something a, a demand to demand means to ask forcefully. So as an adjective, it means something urgent, something important, something you cannot avoid. And therefore, something that takes a lot of time and energy. So demanding responsibilities. These are responsibilities that you cannot avoid and that take up a lot of time and energy. Now, here's the point. How can I tell that this is an adjective and not a verb? After all, the verb demand is much more common than the adjective demanding. I can tell because of the sentence structure. This is a parallel sentence structure. It has a pinching jiggle. So, for instance, the first thing, the second thing, the third thing, sorry, up to here, close friend, the fourth thing. So, these four things should have similar sentence structures. So, let's look at the second thing. Serious illness. Adjective plus noun. We know that responsibility is a noun. Therefore, this should be an adjective. The third one, death, is a noun. Uh, so there's no adjective. The fourth one, loss is a noun. There's no adjective. So the structure is very similar. Adjective or no adjective and noun and then the other information. Uh, let's see. I think this one is quite interesting. Loss of a job or lover. You lose a job or you lose your partner are put in the same item. Very strange. Well, I guess both are important. Um, this is the last item in this list, so there should be the word or in this position. Close friend or loss of a job or lover. So one cause of stress might be something that is overwhelming. Another cause could be when we feel helpless. No way to improve the situation. Because we don't have the ability or the time. So we can't improve the situation. We feel helpless. And that might also lead to stress. So this first paragraph introduces stress in modern life. The next paragraph. When we anticipate a threatening or stressful situation, our body. So this paragraph, I think, is talking about the body's response to stress. Or I shouldn't say response. The response of the body that we feel is stress. We call that response stress. So the word anticipate here uh, means expect. 
but the two words are not exactly the same. Expect uh, means that you think it's probably going to happen. Anticipate means you think it's probably going to happen and you prepare for it. So there is an act of preparation. When you anticipate something. So to prepare for a threatening or a stressful situation, your body will experience the. Fight or flight response. The word flight is the noun of the verb flee. Tao Wang Tao Paul. Um, but somewhat confusingly, the word flight is also the noun of fly, Fei Xiang. So when you see the word flight, you have to look at the context to tell whether the meaning is to fly in the sky or to flee to escape. Here it means to flee. A fight or flight response. So uh, it, psychology tells us that when we face danger, our body will prepare to either fight the danger or to run away from the danger. But really, the body has three responses. Fight, flight. The third one is to freeze and play dead. Uh, this is not often talked about because uh, in modern life, playing dead never helps. Well, often does not help. Um, but it does happen. Some people, when they face a dangerous situation, they freeze. They cannot react. They probably are thinking a lot of thoughts. They probably know that they should do something, but they, their body just will not do anything. Think of when you have to give a speech. When you stand on stage and you start feeling nervous and you can't open your mouth, you can't make yourself say anything. That's not fight. That's not flight. That's freeze. It's when you can't move, when you feel danger and stress. But anyway, this paragraph is talking about fight or flight, only these two. Uh, so to prepare, right? Anticipate, prepare. For fighting or fleeing, the body reacts by increasing its heartbeat, xingtiao, blood pressure, xie ya, and breathing rate, hu xi su lu, su lu. Uh, so we just saw this word rate. Rate could mean a price, but here it means frequency, ping lu. Part of our nervous system. This is 神经系统. This is the system in your body for sense, perception. Uh, becomes active and releases chemicals. Release means to give out, give off, 释放. Chemicals, uh, 化学物质. The noun is, sorry, the, the study of chemicals is chemistry, 化学. OK, chemicals like adrenaline. Uh, you're going to have to remember this word. Adrenaline. Uh, and it's called adrenaline because it comes from the adrenal glands. Uh, of all of the chemicals that our bodies give out, adrenaline is the most common you will see when reading something. So you do need to memorize this word, adrenaline, 身上腺素. Needed for fast action, yes. So that's the body's response. Health experts agree that some stress is necessary for human survival. OK, so it looks like this paragraph will be about good and necessary kinds of stress. 
some stress. Uh, I think this is a little confusing. This seems to be saying that there are different kinds of stress. But really, I think what it's saying is some degree of stress, some extent of stress. Eating the yari, some degree of stress. It can increase our energy level, make us feel challenged. Okay, so usually we think of a challenge as good. It's a chance for us to prove something. It's a chance for us to to learn something. Uh, so challenged, so It's a good thing. Uh, and it will cause physical, emotional changes required to deal with the situation. Yes. Positive stress. So this is the good kind. And of course, the opposite of positive is negative. For instance, a minimum of a minimum of stress. Minimum is the lowest possible level. The opposite is maximum, the highest possible level. So like if you play video games, right, and you move like you are adjusting the level of something and you move it to the highest level, it will sometimes say max. Which is short for maximum. And if you adjust it to the lowest level, it will sometimes say min, which is minimum, the lowest level. But here the the grammar is a little bit different. It says a minimum. If it's the lowest level, it should be the minimum. So when it says a minimum, it does not mean the lowest level. It means a low level, any kind of low level. It's not necessarily only one level. Or not necessarily the same level. Um, so a little bit of stress before making a speech, giving a speech, delivering a speech. Taking an exam, sitting an exam. Or having an interview. Or doing an interview. I think you can also say attending an interview. Uh, and if you're, oh, and another one is to go to an interview. Wait, what did I say? Having an interview, doing an interview, going to an interview, and attending an interview. Is quite normal and healthy, right? Athletes, these are people who do sports. Public speakers, these are people who give speeches. Have long understood. The word long here means for a long time. So you can also say they have always understood. Next paragraph, however, OK, so this tells us uh, the last paragraph was good stress. So this paragraph is the opposite. It will probably be about bad stress. Chronic stress. What does the word chronic mean? The article knows that you probably don't know, so it explains. That is stress that never goes away. So in Chinese, the word chronic we usually uh, say is man xing de, was it chang qi de. This uh, word root, cron, 
has to do with time. Uh, so, for example, chronological. And the Uh, so chronic stress is harmful for our health. Hang on. There's an extra space here. Can you see that? If you use an M dash, you put a In American English, there should not be a space before and after the M dash. OK, it says harmful for our health. A better word is harmful to our health. It causes harm to our health. Therefore, it is harmful to our health. It, um, it, it makes this mistake because it's thinking about another phrase. It is good for you. It is bad for you. Good for your health, bad for your health. But harm, usually you use the word to. Harmful to our health. Uh, reactions to stress include headache, migraine. OK, notice that these words, most of these are non-count. Because it's not saying that you will get many headaches or a few headaches or one headache. It is saying that the kind of reaction is the kind we call a headache or the headache. So it's using uh, non-count uh, nouns. Headache or migraine. Migraine is a special kind of headache. Pientotong. Backache. Beitong, insomnia, when you cannot fall asleep, simian. Restlessness, when you cannot rest, you have too much energy, jingbushalai. Cold hands and excess perspiration. Perspiration means sweat, liu han. Excess means too much. So when you have too much sweat, you're sweating too much. Excess perspiration. Or excessive perspiration. At its worst, which means in the worst case. So it's all Quang. Chronic stress may lead to heart disease, stroke. Stroke is uh, when you have a blood clot in your brain. Zongfeng. So those are the physical uh, reactions. Psychological symptoms, xing li bing zhen. Uh, a symptom is a presentation of disease. If you have uh, this illness, your body or your mind will do these things, and so the doctor can tell that you have this kind of illness. Bing uh, May include tension or anxiety. Tension is zhang li, jing zhang. Anxiety, jiao lu. Anger, you're mad. Depression, you're sad. Pessimism, you think things will be bad. And inability to concentrate or perform at usual levels. So you are less able to concentrate or focus, and you do things worse than you usually do. So this is the opposite of good stress, right? Good stress can help you focus, can help you do better. Bad stress hurts your focus, makes you perform worse. Furthermore, medical research has found that people who keep negative emotions inside, to keep something inside, 
which means you do not express them. You don't let out your negative emotions. These people are at higher risk for heart disease. Notice this phrase at risk for something. So you have the risk that this thing might happen. OK, different people react to stressful situations differently, but we can learn to manage stress. OK, so this paragraph is going to talk about what we can do to help uh, manage our stress, how we can control the bad stress. The Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. This is a famous hospital. Mount Sinai, Shinai San. You probably uh, know the Sinai Peninsula, Shinai Bandao. This is the yeah, on a world map, right? Egypt. And then Saudi Arabia. And between these two countries, there is a small piece of island or peninsula. You go That is the Sinai Peninsula. Actually, let me show you a map. Why? I'm showing you a map. Why does Google? <laughs> oh, come on. OK, thank you, Jesus Christ. So. See, we have a bigger map. No, no. This OK, so this is Egypt. This is Israel, Israel. And between them, this part is the Sinai Peninsula. Right, this part. This is the Mediterranean Sea, Di Zhonghai. This is the Red Sea, Honghai. I spend a lot of time on this because the Sinai Peninsula is very important. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, uh, when Moses leads the Jewish people to wander the desert for 40 years, this is the desert. They're wandering in the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, and when Moses goes on a mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, the mountain that he goes up is Mount Sinai. So the hospital is named Mount Sinai, which means that it was probably started by uh, either Jewish people or Christian people, probably Jewish people. Uh, and it's a very good hospital. Anyway, they give the following advice. Identify, which means to distinguish, to, to recognize, which events cause you to have stress related symptoms. So, symptoms that are related to stress. Symptoms can be for many different reasons. So, it doesn't just say uh, symptoms of stress, it says symptoms that might be related to stress. So identify what things are causing these symptoms. Next, find out your usual ways of responding. Usually, how do you respond to stress? And uh, these ways are probably not good ways. That's why you're asking a hospital. And the last step, learn to develop and substitute more effective responses when needed. If you have to, when needed. Develop, which means here just means learn. More effective responses 
and substitute them. Substitute means replace. Tidai. So learn better ways to respond to stress and use those better ways. Is the advice of medical experts. OK, let's stop here. Do you have questions about today's uh, this part of the reading? OK, so I'll give you some time to move to the other classroom. <laughs> 